Hello and welcome to the Ask Assad Show. I'm Michael Gaines, host of the podcast NOV Today, and glad you are with us today as we continue to bring insight out and share uh, analysis and uh, perspective from NOV and our team here, and look forward to uh, having a great conversation today. Uh, before we dive in and head over to Assad, want to uh, bring in Shelly Dumain to talk a little bit about uh, the show for those that are, are new to uh, joining the Ask Assad show, but also mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to give you some perspective on uh, how you can have your voice here on the show. Hey, Shelby. Hey, Michael. Uh, so yeah, the Ask Assad show is where we ask Assad questions that we have for him, but maybe most importantly, we ask Assad questions from you, the viewers watching this at uh, work or home. Uh, so whether you're on LinkedIn, Facebook, or YouTube, we absolutely encourage you to, to type in any questions or comments you have for Assad. He's uh, our resident expert here at NOV on, on all, all things energy. We come to him with, with all of our questions. And um, that's why we, we created this show so that we could give you the opportunity to ask him your questions as well. Uh, so like I said, you can comment those, LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook. Um, I watch the comments, I'm reading them throughout the show. And then uh, if you have any other questions, we gather a mailbag every week that consists of not only comments, but also emails and phone calls. So to do that, you can email us at askassad at NOV.com. Uh, just send it quick over. It doesn't, you don't have to make a whole uh, article on it, but just give us your questions and comments. And then finally, the other way you can get involved is by giving us a call. So we have a phone number. It is country code plus one three four six two two three four seven nine nine. Uh, you can call, leave us a voicemail. I love this option because you can stay anonymous if you choose to, or you can let us know. We love hearing your names and titles, and and we can feature you on the show. and And we really like to hear uh, your voice. So if you have a question, you can just call us there that way, and uh, we look forward to asking them for asking them to Assad. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. The Ask Assad show. So ask away. Cool. Well, thanks, Shelby. We we'll appreciate it. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we are going to go ahead and bring in, uh, as Shelby uh, already introduced, our resident expert. So Assad Mahana, Director of Business Strategy here at NOV. Assad, it is great to see you. Hello, Michael. How are you doing? Good, good. I am glad Glad to see you. So I'm uh, I'm not going to waste any time. Let's jump right in. Uh, yep. I know that we've got a, a really good show here today, but uh, uh, as always, want to give folks uh, the week in review. So kind of a, a quick recap of major things that have happened over the week and, and kind of get a little bit of your perspective from a, a business strategy uh, point of view. What are what are some things that uh, that that definitely kind of hit the yeah. hit the register for you and piqued your interest? This is an exciting one uh, for us, Michael. I think it was a pretty busy week in terms of news. Um, first, uh, we woke up on Monday with news from Chevron announcing that uh, they're going to take over Noble Energy uh, for a $5 billion deal. Uh, that same day, Halliburton kicked off uh, the earnings season uh, with their second quarter uh, earnings reviews, um, which were, by the way, better than expected. Um, on Tuesday, uh, we got news from BJ uh, Services announcing that they're filing for Chapter 11. And uh, today we had Baker Hughes uh, report their second quarter uh, earnings, and we expect Schlumberger to do the same on Friday. Okay, so quite quite a bit uh, going on for sure. Uh, and I, I know that uh, that there's no no lack of activity happening um, in the the world of of business. It's Especially in the energy space, um, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'm, I'm going to go a, 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 a bit into each one of them. But I, I was going to say, yeah, I, I know that that you you spent more time than I really diving in. So I would love for you, to, uh, if you can, to yeah, maybe kind of jump in those a little bit. Let's let's do that. I'm going to leave the first one, Chevron and Noble Energy, for for the core of the episode. But uh, I want to touch a little bit on Halliburton, BJ, and Baker Hughes. Uh, first, with Halliburton, uh, they've announced uh, uh, positive free cash flow in, in the second quarter, despite severe uh, drop in global activity. They announced 456 million uh, in in positive cash flow, which which was very pleasant to see, up from 12 million in uh, free cash flow from the first quarter. 
Um, uh, their North America revenue dropped 57%. Remember, uh, Halliburton is extremely exposed to pressure pumping. They're uh, the leader. Uh, they have been a leader of pressure pumping market service service market, um, and they've they've been hit the most naturally. So, uh, 57% drop there. Uh, lower activity in Gulf of Mexico as well, but their international revenue dropped only by 17% sequentially, which uh, is uh, also somewhat expected because international markets have been a bit more resilient. Um, they did announce an asset write-off of $2.1 billion, and that's on top of the $1.1 billion of impairments they announced uh, last quarter. Uh, and remember, this is uh, assets uh, uh, being written off because their value uh, has has dropped, uh, primarily in pressure pumping fleets and inventory. Um, uh, Halliburton also announced that they're reducing their their expenses uh, this year by a billion dollars, and that's a, that's a, that's a big number, um, uh, which is what primarily is keeping Halliburton in, in the positive. Um, Moving on to BJ Services, uh, Tuesday was uh, news from the uh, hydraulic fracturing company. Um, they also have cementing services, uh, primarily focused on North America. Um, they too were under heavy debt obligations that they could not service um, and, and had to uh, work a way out with uh, their lenders, uh, which is what got them to filing for chapter 11. For those who know a little bit of history about BJ Services, they had been part of Baker Hughes since 2010. Um, they were purchased for $5.5 billion, which today sounds like an, a massive, massive deal, like we're the one we're talking about. Uh, but then they were spun off away from Baker Hughes um, after Baker became part of GE. Uh, moving on to Baker Hughes, uh, who's reported their earnings today. Um, uh, did not see a big uh, drop in revenue like um, Halliburton did, uh, and that's because of their smaller exposure. Uh, it's funny how these three are all connected. They're less exposed because they didn't have BJ services with them, um, uh, but they too, uh, so, so they reported positive cash flow as well of $63 million um, and maintained dividend, which isn't exactly uh, the norm these days, which is good news for Baker. Uh, one cool thing I found about Baker is that their remote operation increased uh, to 72% 70, of their dr global drilling activity, up from 60% in Q1, which uh, which uh, shows how um, invested uh, the company is in, in turning uh, their operation into a remote activity. Uh, their drop in revenue was only 23% sequentially, 41% um, in North America and 15% international. Uh, and they are on their way to uh, reduce overall costs by $700 million by the end of the year. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, like, like I was saying, I mean, it, there's, there's no lack of, uh, of activity that's, that's definitely transpired and certainly in, in recent days. So I uh, really appreciate uh, the recap there. Yeah. It sounds, sounds like, uh, yeah, with, with uh, kicking off a lot of the, the earnings reports that uh, we'll continue to see how things have, Continue yeah. to transpire. I know that uh, uh, several weeks ago we we indicated that uh, you know there was some analysis out there that said that you know right when the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic happened that Q one was was certainly a little bit uh, of a challenge, but that there was there was some analysis that said Q two would be be a little more challenging. But it's sounding like uh, there's at least a, a little bit of positive news. That's right for sure. So. Good. Uh, so, uh, yeah, to your your opening comment, uh, Assad, uh, and and I think for most in in the the industry, even those that might not be, uh, that they're aware that uh, the the Chevron uh, Noble uh, deal definitely uh, that was something that that folks woke up to this this week. So so that is uh, that's that's certainly something that's kind of been a, an eye opener to to say the least. It is. It's uh, it's the big news of the week, I would say, and it's uh, uh, the the first of what's been anticipated as a uh, time of consolidation of the industry. Um, this uh, the the so Chevron's based in California. They announced on Monday that uh, they would merge uh, or they would acquire rather Noble Energy for what's uh, equivalent to uh, five billion dollars in an all stock deal. And we'll talk a little bit what that means in a little bit. Um, this is the first major deal uh, that we've seen this year after the 
downturn uh, started. Um, and it hasn't been the, the biggest surprise as many of the operators uh, with a uh, low uh, oil price environment for the sixth consecutive year and only the really the last six months being an absolute nightmare. Um, uh, many operators have been feeling the pain and, and kind of been managing their, uh, their balance sheets. Um, uh, Noble Energy has been one of the <clears throat> companies on the, on the watch list. Um, they do have significant debt. Uh, the advantage they have is that they don't have anything maturing uh, anytime soon. Um, so uh, made, made that acquisition a little bit more attractive than uh, some, of the, some of the others. Um, I do want to make a, a slight uh, a note here. Uh, Noble Energy, or between Noble Energy and Noble Drilling, uh, some confuse the two companies. They're very different. Noble Energy is the uh, oil operator, oil producer that we're talking about today. Noble Drilling is the offshore drilling rig contractor uh, that uh, owns rigs and is, is not uh, our, our uh, topic of the day today. Uh, so I assume going forward that when we say noble, we refer to noble energy. Um, right, right. So I mean, one of so one of the the key items certainly uh, of of note and, and interest uh, is the really the the particulars around the the financial aspect of the of the of the deal. So um, maybe we could kind of talk a little bit about that uh, for those that you know may have seen you know big big numbers flash across the headlines, but. But I think it'd be great if we could dive in a little bit and help give some perspective for for folks, right? Mentioning you know an all uh, you know the a, 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 a amount of stock that's involved and, and kind of those things. So maybe that'll be sure. be something we could talk to. Yeah, yeah. So uh, in the announcement, Chevron mentioned they would be issuing 58 million new shares of stock, hmm. uh, and they will also be assuming all of Noble Energy's uh, staggering debt which is at $7 billion. If we do a quick calculation, uh, the 58 million, 58 million shares that, would, that Chevron would issue in equity towards Noble uh, would put Noble share price at 10 point some dollars um, or at 0 0.12 of a Chevron share. Um, uh, so including the, the whole thing, we said $5 billion in market value for the company, um, uh, including the debt, close to $13 billion. Now, the way Chevron's making the acquisition is interesting um, because they're issuing pure equity, uh, pure stock transactions. So no cash will be transacted here. Uh, and this is one of, by the way, s several options that Chevron had or any other M&A deal would have um, where you could, it could be a cash deal, could be full, full debt deal. Uh, a leveraged buyout, which is a combination of, of cash and debt. Uh, the other option is sellers financing or all equity like Chevron did here. Mm. Um, I want to I want to pull up a, a graphic to kind of put this in, in perspective. Um, the all equity option is attractive to, to both really to Chevron and to, to Noble shareholders uh, because because Chevron is not going to take any debt. So they're not going to be making any payments every month or year uh, or period. Um, uh, and when they issue 58 million shares, that among the 1.9 billion, billion of shares already in circulation for Chevron isn't all that much, it's really 3% of the company's value. So because of Noble's assets, the dilution for the existing Chevron's shareholders Will be somewhat limited, so not 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 that huge impact. Um, so uh, again, that flexibility, the absence of uh, commitment for periodic payments, put Chevron in a good position as well as Noble. Um, still, as part of the deal, Chevron's taken on the seven billion dollars, and that's the graph to the right. Um, and they can do that because their existing financial obligations. Are substantially lower than than what's out there when from what we've seen in terms of debt for other operators uh, chevron currently sits at 23.8 24 billion dollars in debt uh, for a market value of 136 billion uh, i think their debt to equity ratio sits a lot better than what nobles uh, is at so at five billion dollars I, I would say it's it's not 
uh, a, a huge deal or a huge matter for Chevron. They can stomach that. Um, in the next, in the next uh, uh, graphic, um, I want to talk a little bit about the premium. Um, and the premium, in, in this case, what with at $5 billion and $10.38 $10 per share for Noble, Chevron pretty much uh, paid about 8% premium. And what a premium is, it's, it's the value or amount paid uh, in an, in an uh, merge and acquisition deal on top of the discounted cash value of the, of the company. So say, you know, true value of the company today is, uh, is, is $5 billion. Um, paying a premium of 10% is uh, paying for the company $5.5 billion. Uh, in this case, uh, the $5 billion that Chevron paid uh, is really the true value of the company plus the 8% in premium. Uh, what these graphs show more more general of what the global M&A premium market uh, or premium distribution looks like um, uh, globally, over 80% of, of deals had a premium of anywhere between 10 and 50%. Um, uh, to the right, that's specific to the oil field, we've seen highs and lows. And, and certainly the, the Chevron's 8% for Noble is in, 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 the low, in the low premium spade. Uh, putting Chevron in a, in a clear upper hand with Noble not having too many options but to take the deal. Um, so, so really, a, a, to emphasize that uh, Chevron uh, paid a fair price uh, without uh, too much premium for, for the Noble acquisition. Um, which reminds us of Anadarko, right? Now, yeah, yeah. I'm glad you you stole the thunder because that's what I was about to say. Is uh, that was another big big deal that recently uh, you know came came about, which so, which okay. actually Chevron was, uh, you know, I think it was reported right, and we know that they were originally interested. But yeah, go ahead. So, question for you, Michael. You want to take a guess what was the premium paid by Oxy for Anadarko last okay. year? Okay. So I I I did. At one point, no, and so for full disclosure, I don't recall off the top of my head, but I'm going to uh, wager a guess that it was probably in the, uh, uh, referencing your last chart, so I'm gonna guess maybe a 30% premium. It's, it's, it's close, it's close, Michael. They paid north of 20%. Okay. Um, which is somewhere, you know, 18 to 20% is the number that we kind of got used to in the oil field, um, it, that's that's the good number, right? That's what kind of people expect. The, the expectations going forward are probably going to drop with with this big one too. Um, speaking of Anadarko, kind of a little reminder: uh, Chevron uh, wisely walked away when Oxy jumped into outbid uh, Chevron's uh, acquisition of Anadarko last year worth 58 billion dollars which with benefit of hindsight looks like it was an ill-timed deal um but really this the anadarko uh walking away uh is important here and it's an important factor because the experience from anadarko paved the way for chevron to announce the somewhat less risky deal but still pretty major so but by not getting in a, into a bidding war last year with oxy chevron Really proved to, to that, that patience will 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 pay off, mm -hmm. and they used the one billion dollar breakout fee or termination fee with Anadarko to use it towards this one. I mean, it's a it's a you know it's a pretty good deal for for Chevron here, right? So let's talk uh, about kind of what so you know this this uh, this uh, definitive uh, 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 deal has has been announced and and they're going to be moving moving forward so. Uh, of course, it's it's now we're wanting to know well what what makes up this this kind of new new portfolio. So uh, if if maybe we can kind of deconstruct it before we kind of look at what this combined uh, uh, entity will will look yeah. like. Uh, what what do you what do you have or what what analysis have you done there? Sure, um, no, Noble Energy's uh, portfolio is a is a rich one. I would I would say um, it, it's uh, it, it falls well with what Chevron has today. Um, they have a leading US uh, unconventional business um, and they have some global offshore assets uh, to complement that. Um, Chevron, 
um, who uh, I think I have a graphic for, um, it, it, it is clearly a, a massive organization with operations all over the world. Uh, most significant areas of operation are North America land, um, uh, uh, Gulf of Mexico, um, West Africa. Uh, they have some work in the Middle East, uh, both in Kuwait and Iraq. Um, they're active in Southeast Asia, South Korea, and some Australia work. Um, and how Noble's uh, portfolio comes in on the next graphic uh, is a is a is a nice uh, addition to just that. Uh, we're looking at some assets in the unconventional world. Uh, most notably Permian Basin, DJ Basin, Eagleford, um, and in the Eastern Hemisphere, assets in East Med, uh, as well as West Africa. I think the the largest strategic fit for Chevron here is 92,000 acres that are largely contiguous, close to each other, extended. They could drill lots of wells, develop uh, uh, large fields in the Permian Basin, close to Chevron's assets. Um, uh, plus adding the DJ Basin and Eagleford assets to that. And, uh, and uh, maybe a, a note on the, on the DJ Basin assets here, it's, it's fascinating. Those are extremely low break even, uh, even some of, some of the people call these cash cows for Noble because their low decline rates or low depletion rates um, fields and at base production, if Chevron doesn't do anything, they stop all the development in the fields in DJ Basin, uh, no drilling, no completion, they could still expect to generate $1.5 billion in uh, uh, free cash flow uh, at $40 uh, WTI. Mm. So, you know, that's already paying off a big chunk of that acquisition. The, the other uh, advantage for Chevron is boosting its position in East Mediterranean through Noble's offshore assets in Israel and in Cyprus. Um, Chevron's also going to have, although they already have some work in West Africa, as we've just seen, they're going to strengthen their position um, in Equatorial Guinea, where they have lots of bases, lots of support. Uh, so great combination. Um, I think the next graphic shows the two on top of each other. Um, I, I think the addition to Chevron's uh, uh, reserves in unconventional is pretty significant. Presence in East Med is also pretty significant. So nicely, nicely complementary there. Right. So you know, it, it looks like uh, you know certainly to your to your point uh, that from a a, st a strategic standpoint uh, in terms of capability that yeah definitely. Uh, looks complimentary as as with other deals. You know, hope, I mean, we're ob obviously hoping for the best on it. Well, you know, hindsight certainly gives us additional perspective. So, looking forward to to seeing how how they're able to capitalize on it. But one of the things that uh, wanted to talk about uh, is, to a certain degree, some of the things that uh, we didn't talk about, which are some of the challenges ahead that uh, that that could be something that 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 they'd want to keep in mind, um, you know, based on some of the, again, the research and analysis that, that you've done, what are some of those things that, uh, that could be items that uh, might be the yellow flags to keep in mind? Uh, you know, being in, in shale, uh, Chevron's going to be faced with what every other shale driller is facing today. It's uh, just a financial bust that's, again, started six years ago and carrying on uh, even uh, more heavily in the last six months or during the year. Um, if we if we also go back if just a few months before the pandemic, Chevron itself wrote off uh, $10 billion in shale gas assets. That's in late 2019. Uh, so the, what they're doing here is really doubling down on uh, their ability to produce a cheap barrel um, in, in great volumes. So, you know, uh, leverage their scope, their, leverage their er, existing assets uh, to expand and uh, stay with a low break-even price. So that's a, that's a challenge where uh, I think they learned from the asset write-offs. I think they paid a fair value for the assets from Noble, but 
again, a big challenge to stay, especially, you know, we're, we're at $40 today. We don't know what the future holds, although optimistic. Uh, but if break evens are in the 20s or 30s, uh, then that's going to be problematic for not just Chevron, but everybody else. Um, the other challenge that comes with uh, Noble's uh, international exposure um, is that Chevron is now inserting itself into somewhat of a complicated web of, web of politics in the Middle East uh, with some disputed borders, which uh, Chevron is not uh, typically into. So that's gonna that's another challenge that uh, Chevron uh, will will face in the long term. And it'll be it'll be interesting to see what they do with with the new assets that they've acquired and whether they'll divest or just combine uh, with their existing work. Well, uh, you know, I think in a, in a future show, I'll, I'll try to create maybe a, or have a chime with me or, or we'll have some, some music with harps or something because I always appreciate the, the Assad silver lining, right? That it doesn't matter so uh, for those uh, that are in the Houston area, right, we had some thunderstorms roll through, but there's some silver linings out there. And, and I think uh, with today's topic, it's, it's no different. So, you know, even even though we have some challenges, uh, you know, on the on the horizon, some thunder clouds, uh, if you will, uh, there's there's a little bit of, of uh, some silver lining. So what what do you see uh, kind of in that regard? You, you know, it's coming, Michael. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know what? It's uh, I think I think this is this holds some good news for the industry. What we've learned uh, over the last few years is that the current industry structure uh, does not work for long-term stability. Um, Shell, understandably, has reshaped um, the supply and demand, uh, but we we haven't really reached a balanced level of activity that can. Uh, sustain that that supply with the demand. Um, it almost feels like the last few years were a bunch of knee-jerk uh, reactions, uh, and, and that needs to be fixed. Um, the, the, I think the solution is that well-paced, optimized, uh, planned production activity that's less reactive to the price of oil. So uh, although painful for some today, uh, a consolidation of the industry uh, and, the, and, the, and the players like it's happening today is, in my opinion, a, a step in the right direction uh, that's, I would say, expected to continue. So, so this, is, this, is, this is great news. Mm, that's good. So I know uh, that we uh, had some, some good comments on uh, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube uh, on the social side of things. So wanted to bring in Shelby Dumaine to see if we can uh, uh, ask uh, one of those questions. I know I, I saw a couple coming through, but Shelby, what do we uh, what do we have for Assad today? Yeah, so I have this question from uh, Roderick, and, and I apologize, Roderick, I might rephrase the question a little bit. Uh, he asked, can you see more mergers and or purchasing deals uh, take place. And I know we, we maybe can't speculate on on any specifically, um, but can you talk a little bit, do you think there's going to be a trend of, of more of these taking place? Yeah, well, uh, I think in a, in a previous episode, we showed uh, some, some graphic on um, how uh, leveraged or what kind of debt obligations do some of the companies out there have. Um, uh, and, and we saw that uh, there's uh, about $7 billion uh, uh, of debt that's maturing uh, uh, very soon. A lot more coming up in the next two or three years. Um, some are already calling this, uh, you know, first period of, or first half of 2020, um, the, the most uh, accelerated um, uh, period of uh, chapter 11s and merger and acquisitions. There have been lots of mergers out there, by the way, and, and there's a couple of dozen already. There's just not as big as the one we're talking about today. Um, but if we compare this to 2015 and 2016, um, and, and, and that those two, three years period that uh, uh, followed the 2014 crash, 
Um, I think uh, uh, we're we're moving at a faster pace and and, and more as expected. Yes. Mm -hmm. All righty. Well, I think I do have one more question. Um, it's a little bit of a longer one, and, and so if, if it if we might need to get to it on a later show, but here I'll go ahead and ask it here now. Uh, so Derek on LinkedIn was wondering, um, how does Chevron's strategic goal of producing the low uh, price barrel align with the Noble deal and double down of the Permian assets, which are not profitable at a low price uh, environment? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Um, uh, uh, I mean, uh, Chevron uh, is already in, in the Permian Basin, so they, they know how to operate it. They have uh, uh, created the supply chain around it. So it's not like they're inheriting a business that they don't know anything about. Um, what's somewhat new to them is uh, what's in the DJ Basin, Eagleford, and, that's, and those are spaces where um, uh, Noble has some more mature assets that are already producing. So... Uh, there, there will be a, a learning curve like anything else. I think the big risk really uh, for Chevron is not in, in shale and the price of barrel. It's in, uh, it's in the uh, more diversified uh, places where Noble is. Um, and that's, those are the places where Chevron might have to uh, uh, learn a few new tricks um, uh, to keep the price of barrel uh, low over there because offshore is certainly challenged um, and note that you know noble in their pipeline uh, they were planning in in, uh, in h2 of 2020 to drill in colombia uh, which is another place for chevron that's going to be new uh, so i would say there's there's certain learning curve there um, but like any other deal uh, that we've seen in the past there there has been divestiture they will find ways to optimize. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if, if we see some of those. Uh, and to close on that question, uh, um, uh, Chevron did mention that by acquiring Noble, um, they will be seeing cost savings of about $300 million, which uh, is pretty good money. Pretty good money. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't care who you are, as they might say. So uh, yeah, no, that's, that's really good. Really uh, appreciate. Uh, I know it took a lot of of, uh, uh, of deep diving into some of the analysis and, and other items that that you're able to put together. But uh, really good insight aside, and certainly looking forward to uh, seeing how how this continues to develop and 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 actually also how it impacts the the broader uh, oil and gas community. I'm sure you and you and others are are going to be watching that uh, pretty closely. So appreciate the. Uh, Appreciate the perspective and analysis. Well, big big thank you to to you, Michael, to to Shelby, and to Paul and Wehan, who are behind the scenes, also making this happen. Absolutely, absolutely, it's uh, the the dream team, that's for sure. Yeah. So uh, good. Well, thanks, Asad. Appreciate uh, your analysis and perspective, and uh, thank you for joining us uh, here on the Ask Asad Show again. Just as a quick reminder, if you have a, a question, thought, or comment that you'd like for Assad to tackle, uh, feel free to send an email. You can do that at askassad at nov.com. You can also call in your uh, your comments, whether you agree, disagree, or just have a, an idea. And again, that number is plus one, three, four, six, two, two, three, four, seven, nine, nine. You can also record a voice memo and email that to us as well. Uh, or you can comment right here uh, on our social media channels. So really appreciate you being a part of today's program. And uh, as always, thank you for watching and for listening. And we'll talk to you later.